You're listening to the New Hope Church podcast. To learn more about what we're doing on the south side of Indianapolis, you can check us out online at becomehope.com. If you like what you're hearing here, be sure you check out one of our companion podcasts. We have a daily devotional podcast called Let's Find Out Together, as well as an apologetics podcast called Salty Saints. Let's listen in as today's talk comes from Jason Kemp. two of a new series that we just started called Imago Day, meaning the image of God. And we've been looking, uh, this last week Randy talked about how God created us in his image, that we were created with God's likeness, innate, as part of our essence as who we are. But along the way, sin has corrupted that image. Along the way, we've allowed things in our lives to distort and destroy the image of God in our lives. And and sometimes it feels like God's image is even barely recognizable at times. But that's where Jesus steps into our story, that he came and died on the cross for our sin so that he could restore us back into the image of God. And a lot of times we think of salvation, of Jesus' salvation as saving us from something. He's saving us from sin. He's saving us from hell. And and while that's true, while that's a part of it, God's desire is that he's saving us towards something, back into his image, to restore that initial creation, that initial image in us, to take all the damage that sin has done and wipe that clean and restore us. You know, if you're a fan of reality TV, you've probably ended up on a show like one of these before. You know, something like Property Brothers or Extreme Home Makeover or um, uh, Good Bones right here in Indianapolis, I just learned. Apparently, I'm behind the times learning about that one. So I guess we got some Netflix to do um, when we get home later. But um, shows like this focus on the fact that here is this house that somebody sees beauty in, that the house isn't what it used to be and things are falling down and and so they come into, the house, into these, in these spaces and they want to transform them. They want to make them new. And so they look at some spaces and they go, oh, if we just put a fresh coat of paint here, it'll be perfect. But other times they've got to go all the way down to the studs. The drywall's got to come out. The flooring's got to come out. They move walls. They change plumbing, electrical, whatever. Whatever it takes to bring this home back into its original glory. And that's what God is wanting to do in us. That he's not wanting to just look at us and slap a coat of paint on us and say, hey, you're looking good. No, he wants to look at our hearts. He wants to get down into our inmost being and see where we're at and what he can do to help restore us back into our original creation, that imago Dei, the image of God. You see, we have all sinned. We've all done things that have fallen short of God's glory, God's holiness in our lives. And the penalty for that, the Bible says, is death, a death that that we cannot satisfy. It's not, it needs a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus offered himself as that perfect sacrifice. Romans 5, 8, one of my favorite verses says that, that God, out of all of his love, looked at us and saw that even though we were sinners, Even though the image in us has been marred and destroyed and made cloudy and even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. He offered to pay that price, that penalty of sin, pay the death that we cannot do on our own because it requires perfection, it requires holiness. And so Jesus stepped in to change our story, to bring us transformation, to return us back to the image of God. And this is something that I wish any of us in this room could stand up, teach a message like this and say, you know, I've got this figured out. This is something that, yeah, I dealt with that 20 years ago and man, life has been great ever since. No, this is something that I struggle with each and every day. That I find things that disappoint me in life or frustrate me and those turn into anger and, and bitterness and cynicism and, and 
those things destroy my attitude and how I treat other people, my family, my coworkers, my friends, my neighbors, my church. And so I have to repent of those things. I have to seek God's forgiveness. That I'm tempted to lie. I hate it, but every day there's some reason in my mind, like, ooh, if I could just twist the truth. Where does this come from? And so, God, I need him to come and restore his image in me. Temptation is around us each and every day. But God has stepped into our stories. Our transformation, our return to the image of God begins with our need of God. That we have to come to a point where we realize that we can't do this on our own. That the consequences, the penalty of sin in our lives is too great. We need a helper. We need someone to come alongside us. That we need God to look into our hearts, not just, just make us look pretty on the, ins- on the outside, but look at our inside as well and to transform us. And I am so very grateful that God does not need us to clean ourselves up before coming to him. It's kind of like the show Hoarders. Y'all remember that one? That you'd have to absolutely clean the house spotless before you could go to Jesus? It's not how it works. Jesus says, just bring me yourself and I will help you along the way. I will begin to transform you. And so we don't have to become this pretty picture before we come to Jesus. And I'm so grateful for that. 1 John chapter 1 Verses 8 through 10 talk about our need for God and how confession and forgiveness plays a part in our lives. 1 John 1 verses 8 through 10 says that if we claim that we have no sin, meaning we don't need God, we have no sin, we're good. We are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him saying, God, we need you, We are dependent on you. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. So we're going to take a couple moments as we kind of move through the teaching this morning about God transforming us into his image We're going to take a couple moments and spend in prayer, spend in confession. That is that last phrase there in 1 John 1 says that we don't want to call God a liar. We want to proclaim together as a church family, as a body together, saying that God's word has a place in our lives. And so I want to invite you to bow your heart, bow your head. Close your eyes as we take just a moment. And I want you to think. God is probably already illuminating something in your life that you need to confess. That in God's holiness, he's saying, hey, I need you to take a look at this area of your life. Let's take a moment and in our hearts, confess to God where we need him. And then I will close this in prayer. Glorious God, I come to you now in need of grace. Throughout this week, a war has been raging in my heart. I find myself looking to people, to situations, and to experiences to give me security, to give me identity, to give me hope. And I've sought from others what could really only be found in you. Forgive me, Lord. Awaken in me the image that you created within me. And teach me to walk in your ways and learn to be more like Jesus in all of my life. You have searched me. You know my thoughts before I think. And you know my words before I speak. You know my past, my present, my future. 
Awaken me now to seek you while you may be found, to call upon you while you are near, and to live a life that brings glory to your name. Amen. I'd like to uh, invite you, if you're able, to stand and sing this song so we can uh, express our need for our God. song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you oh I How I need you You're my one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you You're my one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you God, we need you. We need you to come and root the sin out of our lives so that we can become more and more like you. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Transformation begins with our need for God. And confession is how we, how we display that in our lives. To confess our sin to God, professing our dependence on him. And he wants to bring about something beautiful in our lives. That the junkiness and, and trash of this world, of, of, 
of sin in our lives becomes made new in us. If we go back to the reality TV theme again, a couple more shows maybe that you've watched, um, things like Repair Shop or, um, you know, the... The antique show. I can't think of the name all of a sudden now. Um, Storage Wars, Pawn Stars. These are, these are shows that are developed around the idea of, I want to find that diamond in the rough. I want to find that lost, forgotten, neglected, run down, whatever it is. Repair it, restore it, shine it back up, and find the treasure that people have forgotten about, that we've missed, that we've not noticed. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. He's He wants to take the parts of us that are broken and run down and forgotten and things that we've neglected and we shoved in the dark corners, and he wants to make it beautiful again, to restore it, to show us that beauty. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Romans chapter 12 this morning, that if you've got your Bibles and you want to turn with us, or if you've got your smartphone or device and you want to turn to your Bible there, um, Scripture's going to be on the screen as well, but Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. And this is truly the way to worship him. So don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We're going to walk kind of through this second verse a little bit, uh, looking at a couple different phrases to see what God is looking to do in our lives when he says, we, I want to transform you. First off, Paul to the Romans says, don't copy anymore. Don't look at the ways of this world and copy those things. That copying in Paul's mind is to take on an outward appearance, to just copy something on the outside, to assume an identity and conform. And kind of an image that we can think about in this is if you had a big pitcher of water and you had all these different shapes to glasses, one's just a normal cup, one's a big pitcher, one's a vase that has a a curve in it, or you you get one of those clown cups from the fair and he's got a nose and an arm, you know. And when you pour the water into those cups, the water conforms to the image, to the shape of that cup. The water doesn't change its essence, but it, it's shaped different. It looks different. And so in our lives, we have a similar pressure in us, around us, to assume an identity. That we find ourselves in situations where we, where we question, well, who am I in this place? Because, you know, I, when I'm at home, I act like this, and I talk like this, and I do these certain things around my family. But when I'm at work, I tend to behave a little differently. You know, I use bigger words. I, you know, try and read the thesaurus, and I try and, you know, use a different tone of voice and a different volume and different mannerisms. But then that corporate party comes, and your spouse goes with you to the party, and you find this tension of, well, am who I at home and who I am at work I've got to figure out how to make those work in this environment. And so we see these tensions, we see these situations in our life that, that push us to conform, that push us to copy the ways around us, the ways of this world. And maybe it's you know, a bunch of guys hanging out on Friday night at the golf course. Maybe it's playing cards together, ladies at the coffee shop together, anything like that. We get around different people, different environments, and those things tend to try and shape our outward experience. Maybe it's a Bible study. Maybe it's when we're in our neighborhood mowing the lawn. Maybe it's when we're at a soccer game with the kids or the grandkids. Or when we've got friends and family together playing cards and board games and the real you pops out in the middle of Monopoly, right? We are pressured to conform. And Paul says that it's the behaviors of our world the customs of our world. And a lot of those th- times, those things look like our family and our friends and, and our neighborhoods and our workplaces. And, and these things are good. These places are good. Don't get me wrong. But we've definitely learned over the last year or so that politics forces us, wants to force us to conform into patterns of thinking and patterns of behavior, doesn't it? And sadly, even sometimes the church tries to force us into patterns. 
into ways of thinking that may not be the right way. But Paul says that we are to be transformed. And that word transformed in the Greek is the word that we get metamorphosis from. It's an entire change, a change of our inner being, not just slap a coat of paint on the outside, but we are being changed from the inside out. That that cup of water, yes, it conformed to the shape of that glass, but if we took a tea bag and put that tea bag in the water, it's no longer water. Its essence changes into tea. And that's what Paul is talking about, is that God wants to transform us, for us to go through this process of metamorphosis and become something new. That the old has passed away, meaning that corrupted sin image has passed away, and the newness, the return of God's image in us. And this word transformed is used only a couple other times in the New Testament. It's used in this context of being transformed through the way we think and the way we live. But it's also used in the Gospels when Jesus goes up the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And when they get to the top of the mountain, the glory of the Lord settles on Jesus. That this cloud, this this fog of heaven settles around Jesus and the three disciples. And Jesus is transformed. He goes through this metamorphosis that... His original image shines through. His godliness shines through. And Peter, James, and John are like, we're done. We're going to, let's build a house. Let's just stay, we're going to stay here forever. We're good. Because look at Jesus. He has been transfigured. He's been transformed right before us. We want more of this. See, transformation reveals God's image in us. That it takes all of that destruction, all of that mess from sin, and it cleans it up. It repairs it, it restores it. And it's revealing our original image in God, in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about a veil. That sin is like a veil before our eyes and we can't see clearly. But whenever we turn to God, God lifts that veil. And suddenly we can see. And when that veil is removed, we begin to see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And in verse 18 it says, The Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him. As we are changed into his glorious image. So transformation in us is restoring that image of God in us. That the sin, the veil of sin has been lifted. We can see clearly and God's image begins to be reflected in us. As we are changed more and more day after day, week after week, month after month to be more like him. And God's transformation in our lives is complete. There is nothing else that we need beyond the work of Jesus in our lives. The transformation is complete. There is nothing that we are lacking. It's not Jesus plus something else. That we need Jesus in just one more thing. You know, there's some false gospels out there today that that try and break grace up into bite-sized chunks. And it gives us a little bit for today, and we got to come back tomorrow, and, well, if you miss that one on Friday, well, then you better be sure you take communion on Sunday and get a little bit more Jesus. And and we kind of piecemeal grace throughout our lives, but that is not how God's grace works. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14 talk about this. In verse 11, it says, under the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest, Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand, and there he waits until his enemies are humbled 
and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, Jesus on the cross, that single act of sacrifice, for by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. You see that in that last line? That we are forever made perfect. Perfect, good for all time, that single sacrifice. We are made perfect. Past tense, done, it is complete. But then Paul goes on to say, those who are being made holy. So it is both and. It is complete, it is done. There is nothing more than Jesus we need. But yet, our transformation is a journey. It's a process That it has been made perfect in those who are being made holy. So it's complete, it's done, but it's also something we are journeying through each and every day. Transformation is a journey. In Philippians 1 verse 6, it says that I am certain that God who began the good work within you, the good work of transformation, he will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So the mysterious transformation of God somehow is perfect and complete in the moment of grace, yet is continuing on throughout our lives, made perfect in our last days when we meet Jesus face to face. It's a beautiful transformation. And God says that that transformation takes place that as we begin to change the way we think, Transformation takes place as we begin to learn how to live like Jesus. That we'll be transformed through the renewing of our minds. That our our hearts and our lives will be changed from the inside out. There will be an inward change reflected in our outward expression. We will be different. There will be something different about us because Jesus intervened. And the more we begin to know about Jesus in our lives, the more we spend time with him, the more the process of transformation takes place day after day. Ezekiel 36, 26 has a beautiful verse. God says that I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I'll take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Get rid of that stony stubbornness in us and take on God's loving, tender, responsive heart. So how do we change the way we think? What does that look like? When God transforms us, how how does that process of thinking day after day or learning to know what Jesus is like so that we can be like him How does that work? Another false idea that we hear in our culture often is that when you come to Jesus, you are going to experience prosperity and success. Everything's going to be good. You're not going to have a rough day in your life. It's smooth sailing from here, right? That's not how it works. That as we get to know Jesus, as we become more like Jesus, sure, there will be opportunities for success. There'll be opportunities for prosperity because that does happen in life. But if we are truly getting to know Jesus, we'll understand what it means to be misunderstood. We'll understand what it means to be marginalized, to be pushed aside. We'll understand what it means to be rejected, maybe even by our own family, by our own friends. We'll learn what it means to be persecuted when we stand up for what is right. And we will learn what it means to take up our cross day after day. Paul gives a very similar description of transformation in Colossians chapter 3. If you want to turn your Bibles to Colossians 3, we're going to be in verses 10 through 17. He uses very similar language talking about this transformation. In verse 10, he says, Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. 
that we're to put on our new nature. The language in that verse is the same as when Paul is talking about the armor of God, that we need to put on the breastplate of truth. Putting it on means like to, to be clothed, to, to just take Jesus and cover ourselves as if he is a cloak for our lives. And that we're to be renewed, that he wants to move us from the old to the new, to be renovated and restored and transformed. To learn to know our creator and become like him. And that's language we've used around here for a lot of years, to become like Jesus. To learn to live like him, to learn to love like him, to learn to go like Jesus in our lives. You know, there's a theory that says we have a predefined amount of energy for decisions in our life. That each day you kind of get a decision-making energy bucket, and every little decision begins to deplete that bucket. So you wake up and you think, hmm, what am I going to have for breakfast today? Whoop. Hmm, what should I wear today? Whoop. Should I take Smith Valley or County Line? Because the four ways, yeah, either way, I'm never, there's road construction everywhere. Every little decision begins to deplete from that bucket. And by the end of the day, if you have a really big decision to make, you're out of energy. And you're just like, whatever. Just do, what do you want to do for dinner? I don't care. Just stick the credit card in and let's go, you know. An example of that, who kind of made that famous, is Steve Jobs. Y'all remember him? He's uh, the founder of Apple, the visionary behind the iPhone. Most, many of you probably have one in your pocket today. But look at Steve Jobs' wardrobe over the years, from 98 to 2010. He evolved greatly, didn't he? I mean, in 2001, he tried black shoes. This was a man who believed in that energy bucket, and he said, fine, the black mock turtleneck shirt, the acid wash jeans, and the white tennis shoes, that works for me. I'm comfortable. I don't want to use any of my energy-making decision bucket for what I'm going to wear each day. So I'm going to buy a ton of black shirts, a ton of jeans, and a ton of tennis shoes, and that's just my thing. And you end up with images like this online, (laughs) displaying that. But this is what God is saying, that we are to be clothed with Jesus in such a way that when we wake up in the morning, we just say, I want Jesus, the black turtleneck and the jeans, I'm good. I want Jesus. And so it becomes this quick, easy decision where we just say, I want to put Jesus on today. And I want to learn to know my creator and become like him. But what does that look like? What if what God wants to transform us into is something that we're not sure that we want? I mean, God forbid he might send us to Columbia, right? (laughs) It was great. How many years in Columbia? 17 17 years. Now that happens sometimes, sure. But it's not about what God wants to send you to do or send you somewhere to go do something. It's about who God wants you to be, of reclaiming that image of God in us. Still in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17 gives a beautiful picture of what God wants to transform us into. That as he reveals God's image, his very own image in us, this is what a life transformed will look like. Since God chose you to be holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds all of us together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And that comes from Christ, rule in our hearts. And always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. And sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. 
And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. That is what God wants to begin bringing from the inside out in us. That that inner change makes an outward expression different in our lives. And it's something that I want. Can we agree with that? That list of things right there in Colossians 3. I want all of that. I want God to make that change in me. I want to be a part of a people who are known for tender-hearted mercy, gentleness, kindness, humility, and great patience. Can you imagine being part of that each and every day? That we, we begin to make allowances for each other's faults, knowing that Jesus forgave us, and so I want to forgive you, and so I'm going to extend that same mercy, that same grace to you. Because I want to be clothed in love, God's agape love, an unconditional, unfailing, perfect love, so that we can live together in perfect harmony. It doesn't mean that we'll never hurt one another because part of beautiful harmony is dissonance that is resolved in the glory of Christ. And let, let God's peace wash over our lives. That one alone is worth the price of admission, right? In our world, to have peace, just a glimpse of God's peace. It says we're members of one body, meaning we have a place to belong that we're a part of a family, we're part of a community, that I have an identity as a person made in the likeness of Christ, and I belong. And our hearts would overflow with thanksgiving. We would be filled with love, and it says in all of its richness, fill us. I mean, prosperity in our culture is one thing, but to be filled with the richness of God is beyond compare. And it says that we'll teach and counsel each other out of wisdom. Can you imagine being a part of a community that is just so full of wisdom that we hear that teaching, that counsel, that, that shaping from other people as Jesus speaks to us through our friends, through our family, through our community, and we have the opportunity to do the same. And it says we'll sing hymns and songs and spiritual songs to God. And I know some of you are sitting there going, well, I, I'm not even good playing the radio, much less singing. But I think in a transformed life, it's our hearts, our lives that sing and make beautiful music together in that perfect harmony, giving thanks to God. That's the type of transformed life Jesus wants to bring to us, to you, in your daily living. So our big idea today is that to be transformed into the image of God, we need to live, love, and go like Jesus. As we spend time with God, with Jesus, we begin to learn who he is, and we learn to emulate him. And he begins to transform us in the way we think, in the way we live, and all of these things that we just said out of Colossians 3 become true in our lives. Of tenderhearted mercy and kindness, humility, love, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, mercy, belonging, purpose. So what's our next steps? What is your next step today? Because we have the opportunity when we walk out of this place to let the patterns of this world come back in and start conforming us. That there's going to be the pressure as soon as we walk out of this place to begin thinking the way that we've probably thought for a long time in our lives. Or we can walk out and we can figure out what it is we need to do in our life to get the black turtleneck shirts and the jeans and the white shoes 
and put on Jesus each and every day. For some of us, that might mean setting aside a very specific time to pray. That we just need to be in silence and solitude with God. That all of this world can just fade away and I just focus on God each and every day for that time. Some of us, it might be setting aside time to read from God's Word. To find specific um, direction from His Word in our lives. And there's a ton of resources online to have devotionals emailed to you every day. There's apps that uh, put reminders on your phone. There's the Bible app with all types of reading plans and things. Maybe you just need to get into God's Word a little bit more each day. Or maybe it's in how you treat others. Maybe it's a decision in your life that God's been calling you to make for a long time and you need to make that decision to move forward with Him. For me, it's music. There are certain albums and songs that I have to turn on each and every day to help keep my mind focused on Christ. What is it that you need to do to put on Christ each and every day? To continue to be transformed into His likeness. If you need to put a reminder on the bathroom mirror or on the dashboard of your car, do something to help you remember to put on Jesus. Thanks for tuning in to the New Hope Church podcast. If you would do us a favor and like or subscribe on your favorite platform, we would really appreciate it. Also, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at questions at becomehope.com. Have a great week and know that we are praying for you as you seek to be Jesus in every corner of your world.